Welcome. I want to talk about the problem from the past. I worked on this when I was a grad student and as a postdoc a little bit. And uh, it's especially a theorem of Hjors, Greg Hjors, who unfortunately passed away early. And he was an instructor at the same time at Caltech than me, and he showed me a beautiful result. Uh, I had, as a grad student, pondered the problem of deciding whether a measurable set in a probability space is a uh, co-boundary or not, if you have given a dynamical system on it, a measure preserving invertible transformation of this probability space. This can be an irrational rotation, for example, it can be a group translation, it can be a Bernoulli shift, it can be anything uh, reasonable. Uh, stochastic processes are always given by dynamical systems. So uh, if you take a function, a random variable, and you evalu evaluate it along the dynamics, you get a stochastic process. So it's a very, very general framework. A is a sigma algebra, Polish topological group, separable metric, complete metric group. And uh, we have the addition is just a symmetric difference, the Boolean addition. So A plus A, this is also written A plus A, delta A, A plus A is always zero. And zero is the empty set. And uh, you can ask yourself now, you have a derivative. If you have a dynamics, you have a derivative. You take the difference between T A minus A. Minus is the same than plus in a Boolean algebra. So what we have is actually T A A inverse, which is T A plus A. So that, these are the co-boundaries, it has the derivatives, like the exterior derivative. So we have the co-boundaries and we have the co-cycles. And uh, the A, that's the measurable states are the co-cycles and we have co-boundaries. And you can ask yourself, what is this first cohomology group? So I wonder, as a grad student, it's always fun to think about problems which uh, are natural. It's a very natural problem. What is this first cohomology group? It turns out this has been studied in the 60s, especially by Russian mathematicians. Kirillov. It's a problem, cohomology of dynamical systems, which has its roots early on. Hilbert has mentioned it in his fifth problem for Neumann, pondered it. So there are many uh, places where this uh, uh, cohomology problem uh, appears. But this is kind of a particularly simple problem, which for me appeared in the context of Lyapunov exponents. If you have a hyperbolic situation, you have a stable and unstable manifolds, and you want to destroy that, you want to kind of perturb the system so that the Lyapunov exponents are zero. And what you do, of course, you kind of, kind of just if the, if the stable and unstable directions are close together, you just m merge them. Kind of you flip around, you flip from the stable to the unstable, you make that. But uh, even experts make this wrong. If you do that, you don't get ne necessarily kill the upper of exponents. So what happens is I started this in 91 in a paper. Um, when are this, when do you have really these continuities of Lyapunov exponents? How do you destroy Lyapunov exponents? Then this uh, a, a co-boundary problem matters. This is a theorem of step in another Russian mathematician, T cross A. If this is, this is a Gothic, if and only if, this is not a co-boundary. So A has the cardinality of the continuum. Uh, B also has the cardinality of the continuum. So you ask yourself, what is the quotient? It's not clear what the cardinality is. Especially if you look at the finite case, if you have a finite probability space, just a finite set, and you have a mutation there, then this homology group is just z2 to the k, where k is the number of, number of cycles. So if it's a godic, especially if you have a, a cyclic permutation of a finite set, then this is just z2. The odd sets are the not co-boundaries, the even sets are co-boundaries. You can easily check that uh, every even set can be written as a, a set plus its shifted set and every odd set uh, cannot be written like that. So it's kind of a little bit surprising that uh, in general, if you look at the uh, aperiodic case, if you look at the a gothic case, but not uh, you don't have atoms, you don't have discreteness, what happens is that this becomes uncountable too. So this uh, uh, involves some uh, genericity considerations, which is close to the axiom of choice. So this is not a finite mathematics. This is close to logic also. It's very interesting what is the, what, what this is very close to 
source, very close to the foundations of mathematics. What happens here, so incountability uh, comes in. Uh, Greg, uh, he, was, he was an instructor at the same time than me at Caltech, and I asked him about this, and he overnight just showed me uh, a proof, and here is his proof. It needs a little bit of descriptive set theory, so you have a this is a continuous map, and this is a Polish group. Polish means separable and complete metric group. And uh, so this is a continuous map. And uh, so then you look at this derivative D, which is an uh, endomorphism on this uh, space. And there's a kernel is C2 by ergodicity. So B, the co-boundaries, uh, co you look at the, this is an injective image of, so there's a theorem of Lucien's Susling losing Suslin, <laughs> which says that uh, B is a borrow set and so has the bare property. That's important, the bare property, so that you can use the bare category theorem. And the image of B is not open. There's a dense set of, a dense set, so B is dense, so this is not open, and so it's meager. That's a, a theorem of Pettis. And then, uh, then uh, because you have the uh, equivalence relations, which, which is meager, then also there are uncountably many equivalence classes. Well, so that's the theorem how uh, Greg uh, proved it. And it occurred to me when I talked last time that uh, actually we can also use the kind of something coming from the same time at Caltech. There was this development of singular continuous spectrum, especially the Wonderland theorem of Simon which uh, kind of deals with kind of more the spectral aspect of this story. So the link is like that. Lemma from 91 is that T A square is a body given the only if A is not a co-boundary. T A is the induced map. So you have a subset, a positive measure. If it's zero measure, then it's the zero element. So if it's positive measure, it will return by Poincare recurrence again just in finite time and almost every, for almost every initial condition. And so you have a well-defined return map. It's like a Poincaré return map. And uh, so this is then a map on A, and this defines then again an operator, a unitary operator, and you can uh, realize all these operators on the same Hilbert space. That's no problem. So first of all, then we need a, a theorem, which I think has first been proven by Friedman Friedman and uh, Ornstein, an unpublished uh, report that, uh, that is, it's in the book of Friedman, a ergodic theory book from the 60s, which says that uh, the set of A where T A is weakly mixing, that stands. So they explicitly use this rolling tower construction to actually kind of uh, do that. So there are many things which are known to be where weakly mixing is dense, you have just to exclude eigenvalues except eigenvalue one. So there are lots of results now, like also polygonal billiards are generically weakly mixing. And so the Wonderland theorem tells you that, uh, that then this has to be generic. So if you have no point spectrum, or the, or the complement of the constant functions, if you have no point spectrum, then it's, it, if you have no point spectrum on a dense set, then this has to be uh, automatically G delta and so generic. So then uh, this is the kind of leads to the same conclusion that that B is uh, meager. Then you have the same conclusion. The equivalence classes are uncountable. Still many, many questions open. For example, that one of the earliest works on that Kirillov in 67 asked whether if two transformations have the same, the same space, have the same co-boundaries, are they conjugated? As far as I know, this is still open. A very interesting thing, and it's interesting whether you are alone on this earth, that they're doing mathematics, nobody's interested, maybe a five people in the world are interested about this, but it's interesting, it's just at the heart of mathematics, very close to source, very close to the foundations of mathematics. Countability plays a role, really kind of foundations of mathematics play a role. The axiom of choice plays a role. <clears throat> so it's a little bit surprising because for finite sets, as I said, this is very small. This group is very small. This is Z2. <clears throat> uh, 
Now, also surprising is because uh, if you look at, this, you can define this is actually like a Dirham cohomology. I see this as a Dirham cohomology example, just a one dimension, one dimensional case. You can also look at even higher dimensions. If you have D commuting transformations, you can define a Dirham cohomology. It turns out this Dirham cohomology is equivalent to a uh, Simplicial cohomology, which is kind of a group cohomology of Eilenberg MacLean, and it's also equivalent to a, another cohomology of equivalence relation cohomology by Feldman Moore. So there are three cohomologies which are equivalent, and the higher cohomologies are all trivial. I wrote once a paper about that also at the time when I actually stopped doing uh, research because you have to, <laughs> at some point, you know, you have to. Uh, decide whether what, what you what what you can do, and uh, so a, uh, it was already then kind of uh, hard to get the, to get the job. And today it's even much more difficult. You have a lottery, it's a lottery. And it matters in lattice gauge theory, for example, you have a you have a random uh, you have your random process on on uh, on plackets on squares which tile space and what you want to do is you want to realize that as a line integral along the boundary where these are also stochastic processes which give you the gauge field. So this is kind of like the uh, vector potential and then on the placket you have the like directly in higher dimensions. So lattice gauge theory deals with kind of you take space is made up of you know little cubes and then you have the the field elements are on the plackets, and then you have the, the one forms are on the edges, and then these are the two forms, and then you go around the uh, square, and then you get the uh, exterior derivative. That's different than for simplicial cohomology where you have triangles. So what, what, what the Ram theory does is you relate the usual cohomology which you have in calculus, for example, Diffie-Grad curl, you have this qx minus py, for example, or you have the, the curl or the divergence, well, which are all related to cubes. And then you have simplicial cohomology, which deals with tetrahedra. And this can be related. You can relate this with this by a chain homotopy. That's what Dirham did, the genius of Dirham. And this is also uh, works in this agotic setup that you have an equivalence between the cohomology, which is kind of based on, you know, kind of discretization of the theorem and the discretization which you have from the simplicial um, setup. But they are all these cohomology groups are trivial. So I was actually quite uh, intrigued by this kind of thing as a grad student because it allows you to, to deal with also physics on a kind of, you know, bounded like a probability space or something bounded. For example, take the circle or a torus and you take irrational rotations and two different irrational rotations, for example, alpha and beta rotation. And then what you have is a two dimensional lattice. If you have three rotations, you have a three dimensional lattice. And three, three means that the alpha, beta, gamma do, do not satisfy any uh, conditions, you know, rationality condition. And then you have a three dimensional lattice within the circle. Right? which is kind of really cool. So you have a circle, and then you have x, and you have px, and you have sx, and maybe you have ux, you have three different things. You have actually a three-dimensional lattice there. And then you can take, if you take a function here, if you take a function here, and then you evaluate it along the orbit, you have actually a function on the three-dimensional lattice, even so you are in an almost periodic situation. And I wrote a paper with Berthoff on almost periodic cellular automata, which is cool, was a cool thing. Framework where you define cellular automata maps on now sets of, of the circle. Or uh, you can look at uh, fluid dynamics or a general relativity. Uh, which I also, there's a paper I wrote at Caltech with Reed. That's a situation where you don't have that awkward situation that if you have, you have to assume some asymptotic flatness, for example, in general relativity, you have to assume that things are flat at infinity. <laughs> Otherwise, you cannot prove anything mathematically. So either it goes to zero, or you have a finite manifold. You are on a finite manifold, like a three sphere, but that's another possibility. You just do everything in a space, and in a finite space, and then you have a closure you can integrate. For example, you have an average. Uh, even so, this is infinite, but still we are in, a, we have averages. This is almost periodic.
Well, let's let's stop here.